Welcome to the LPS Conversation. I'm James Murphy, Chief Executive of the Royal Philharmonic Society. This is the second of our conversations that we're presenting especially for classical music lovers, aiming to cut through some of the noise and the stress and the uncertainty of the pandemic and give you a candid and human impression of how music makers are faring through all of this. Today, we're talking to four composers about writing music in these times. The story of classical music is a story of constant invention, of composers continually creating new sounds that both speak to the world's concerns and also lift us above them. Where does that story go now? I'm delighted to be joined by the composers Roxana Punovnik, Daniel Kidane, Hannah Conway and Sir James Macmillan. We'll be talking about how lockdown has impacted what they are writing, what challenges are composers sure to face in the months ahead, how might the extraordinary music making we've seen at home and online in lockdown affect what composers write in the future? And how indeed might the changing sound of the world now change the sound of music? A warm welcome to you all. There's a likely very outmoded impression of a composer spending all their days in isolation, in a garret, all alone, scribbling away with their quill. Um, if that's true, then maybe of all the professions, you were the most ready for self-isolating. Um, tell us each of, each of you, maybe Roxana first, um, how sudden lockdown affected you and what were you working on as it began? Well, I was, I was working on two things. Um, I was writing a piece for um, the Salisbury Girl Choristers who are having their 30th anniversary next year. I was writing them an anthem um, and had luckily just about managed to get in and see them and meet them before lockdown happened. Um, but also preparing and helping choirs prepare for, I had a big premiere for 10 choirs and symphony orchestra on the 1st of May scheduled in Berlin and was very much involved in the rehearsing and talking to all the choir directors. So of course that went. And, um, but it's been a complete roller coaster. I mean, the highs and the lows and, and the highs of um, amazingly not having to go anywhere has been fantastic and um, it's been a much more creative time but the lows of having those concerts cancelled but also you know within and I'm sure everybody else is the same you know we all have close friends and close, close cl colleagues who are performers and um, and I think it's probably been much more of a struggle for them than it has initially for us. Who next? Um, Hannah? Uh, yeah, so I was, when, when lockdown kind of came, happened, I was due to start uh, making a piece of work, um, an opera about permanent voice loss with um, people who are affected by motor neuron disease, Parkinson's um, and people who've had laryngectomies. And we were just about to start all the devising workshops for that. And so that's all totally stopped. So we've had to totally restructure that project um, and are working now entirely online it's a project called sound voice so uh that's just been totally reshaped and reimagined and then other work that i was involved in uh for example conducting the uh a show our show at streetwise opera we, we had a big production with uh roddy williams and chris glynn and the brodsky quartet and um that was all cancelled this year um and, and just to explain to to explain to people at home that Streetwise Opera um, um, creates opera with homeless people and makes them really part of the creative engine of the opera. That's opening. right. So one of uh, one hat that I wear is as artistic director of, for that organisation. It's an amazing org organisation that work with yeah people who who are affected by homelessness, opera, and world class artists, and throw those three things together and and see what comes out in the mix. So yes, it was our big big production this year. Um, which oh, is well. um, Daniel? Um, yes, similar to the other guys, I was supposed to be out in America working with Seattle Symphony Orchestra uh, for a premiere, um, doing a bit of teaching out there as well. Um, so obviously that was cancelled, no flights. Uh, unfortunately, Seattle was uh, a, a hotspot in the States earlier on, so that was definitely off the cards. Still waiting for my flights to be refunded. Um, and actually there were a few other sort of concerts. Luckily, um, I wasn't sort of writing anything specifically for that period, but um, it was, for me, it's been very interesting to know and to deal with how things have sort of been shifting very rapidly in terms of, you know, 
first of all, it was a concert, a live concert, and now it's all going online and how are we doing it, you know, uh, and that sort of, I, I suppose as a composer, I, I like a challenge. Um, uh, I suppose composing in itself is, is challenging and, you know, you have to choose notes. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a, it's been an interesting time. And over the summer, I was supposed to be in Cheltenham uh, teaching at the Composer Academy, heading that up um, and working with Chinookay Orchestra. Uh, but again, Cheltenham's been cancelled um, until next year. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, a, a lot of cancellations, a, a lot of trying to rebook things and um, yeah, interesting times. Gosh, yes. James, how about for you? Yes, okay. Yes, I was uh, writing, again, two, two pieces like Roxana. <clears throat> One was for... Uh, a choir and orchestra and soloists in, on the west coast of America <clears throat> for next year. Um, that piece is now complete. Uh, and the other piece was for the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra and Manfred Honick, um, who's a, 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 great, a great musician and a wonderful orchestra. Um, that piece is now complete too. And uh, so I've got through work very quickly uh, which on one one level has been has been marvelous and I think I echo what 's already been said or has been implied that uh, in some ways um, lockdown for composers is uh, is life as normal uh, we 're used to this solitude and uh, silence um, it 's a necessary solitude and silence it 's where we find our our souls uh, in order to to compose music. Um, uh, so in some ways, perhaps, uh, we composers may be better placed psychologically, spiritually for what's happened compared to others. But uh, as Roxana says, you know, we, we, are, we are musicians and we have, we have a, a sense of outreach in, in many, many different things that we do. Um, we're obviously writing music for a public. Um, we hope that that music will be performed, uh, but we know that there's going to be a delay. Perhaps we're used to the delay anyway. Uh, I, I, I tend to be writing music for performances that are a year away. Uh, it might be more than that this time. And, and it's just making that psychological step to get used to it. Uh, it's, it's possible to embrace it, but I know um, it can be, it can feel like a kind of moment of existential angst for many um, musicians uh, or people involved in the arts. Um, and a lot of my colleagues who are singers and performers um, are having a very, very hard time. And I think uh, um, in, in our different ways, in our very different ways, we, we have that interface with the public one way or another. And, uh, and all that has gone, of course, all the concerts, all the teaching, um, all the seminars and so on, and the, the talks and the lectures and so on, that, that, that's all gone. And that's been a huge loss. Um, because we really miss people. We, we miss talking about things that we love. We miss sharing our love of music with uh, as many different kind of people as possible. Um, but we live in the hope that some kind of normality will return and, and, uh, and that that day will not be too far away. Have any of you um, been inspired to write other things? I mean, amidst all of this, it seems like you've had, as well as your, your composition, you've had a lot of bureaucratic stuff to, 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 to deal with and to, to, to wade through. But um, beyond that, has the muse um, flickered at all? Have you found yourself writing anything you didn't expect? Yes. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, um, there's been some fantastic um, virtual music making projects. And, um, and I think a trend we're going to see um, from now on is that, that what you see is going to be as important as what you hear. And, um, and I did something which I hugely enjoyed, which I'd never sort of really done before. Um, principal trumpet from the CBSO, Alan Thomas, um, sent me a picture of Broadway Water Tower and um and asked me to write a fanfare for him to perform outside the tower and um, that people you know in the surrounding area could hear and that was really interesting because i was having to think about the tower its atmosphere never ha i haven't been there but from what i could see from the picture but also what people would be able to hear and how the wind might affect you know the sound and everything so it was a very new experience and it was it was great fun. I really enjoyed it. 
Lovely. That's that's a promising note. Anybody else? Yeah. Making a new I was just going to say that um, similar to, to making the most of the moment type of thing, but um, I hooked up with uh, Sean Shibe and wrote him a, 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 a mini piece for himself. He's he's four times, uh, you know, he's playing, there's four electric guitar parts, but he's playing each of them. It's the uh, sort of wonders of technology that you can sort of do. Um, so off of the back of that, we decided to collaborate again. And I'm currently writing him a piece for electric guitar and eight tape recorders. I mean, I don't usually use tape recorders or sort of uh, more avant-garde uh, sort of techniques, uh, if you want to call it that. Um, but um, it, it, it's, it's a result of people have to self-isolate. As musicians, you can't, you know, you can't just get a, a chamber group together um, to record something. So instead of going on the, sort of the Zoom and the video call met method, um, I decided to go old school and get some cassette tapes, get some cassette decks and um, sent them individually to different players. Um, and then they will all be sent back to Sean for him to play against. So um, yeah, it's, it's nice. I, I think, as I said before, it's, it's, it's a, trying to get something positive out of a, or, sort of negative situation if you want to call it that you know it's a pandemic but um switching that around into a, a creative outlet it seems that um you know it's obviously in your your dna as composers to respond to the very moment i mean hannah you were saying about the the, the thing you've been thinking about voice loss you you're, you're reconfiguring that in the moment um is this is this what you always do as composers or are you usually set on a path and you have a very clear goal and you don't want things to disrupt it or are you are you used to a kind of disruption um, I can immediately say that I'm very, very used to disruption. In fact, all for whole my my whole career has sort of thrived upon um, disruption and collaboration with diverse communities. And I would never be writing what I write unless I had incredibly rich collaboration and um, and kind of co-creation with the performers, uh, with ultimately the people who are going to be performing the work, whether they be the professional ensemble that I'm working with, um, or, or be, like I say, incredibly diverse types of communities of all ages and backgrounds. Um, so that for me definitely is absolutely at the heart of everything I do. And for example, with the, with the COVID pandemic, you know, there's been a real opportunity. We've, we're, at the moment we're trialing throat mics with um, people who've had laryngectomies because where there's physical distancing necessary um, they're not able to project their voices um, uh, with the al al laryngeal voices can't travel as far so we're testing new throat mics to, to enable that um, across physical distancing and I've been uh, developing a chorus for a choir called um, a choir, a laryngectomy choir um, run by an organization called Shout at Cancer to trial that throat mic technology. So that, like I say, just that's an example in terms of disruption and, and I'll be writing that music with them to actually really understand what can work and what can't work within A, that technology, B, that social situation and, and C, with that group, with their ability, musical ability and, and in terms of what they want to be communicating and how they want to be communicating it. Given what you both just said there, I mean, it seems that we could be on the brink of a really exciting creative moment, a, a real creative outpouring from this, if, you know, the funds, uh, we find the funds to, you know, to pay you all to do the things, because obviously you, you don't just do this for fun, this is a living for all of you. Um, I wanted to come to something that, that James said about the, about the audience, and um, evidently you all cherish your audience, and, and, and indeed they're part of, the, part of the making of a lot of what you do as well, but... Uh, is it, is it, does it feel weird therefore as a composer that the audience is not so immediate? Like you can't go to a concert hall and, 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 and th feed off their energy um, or meet them so regularly, or can you? Are you feeling that loss to an extent? Well, uh, um, one, one has to project into the future all the time uh, when you're writing music. And um, the music wouldn't be the way it is if it wasn't for this silent time, for this, um, um, lonely time, if you like, um, it, it's where the it's where it all happens uh, in the in the silence of our own hearts, um, and so that that's an unbroken.
connection, a relationship from the, from the silence of your own thoughts and feelings um, through the performing musicians to the people who will eventually share the experience uh, in a very public way. Um, um, so, sorry, somebody's just trying to deliver something at the, uh, <laughs> the Inevitably. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but uh, yes, I mean, a lot of my enthusiasms and my activities nowadays, um, before, before the lockdown and after, have been channeled into a new festival. Uh, it's called the Come Not Trist. It's a, 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 a festival I set up uh, about seven years ago. And a lot of my um, thoughts uh, about that is about how, how, do we, how do we develop new audiences in an area that is not normally associated with classical music. It's the area I grew up in, in East Ayrshire, not too far from, from here. It's a, a demographic that uh, sometimes is not associated with, uh, with classical music for one social or political reason or another. And I think we all have <clears throat> had experience of working with new communities and trying to bring new, uh, new listeners uh, to, to our art form, to enthuse them and to, sh to show um, um, people who would not normally get the, the, the entry to classical music or in new music, uh, just how wonderful this culture is. So in a sense, um, our organisation has always been geared to that. Um, before lockdown, there was a new school being built in the town. Uh, and of course, all the construction work around the country has had to stop. And, and that school it, it was going to, is going to have a brand new audit, auditorium, uh, seating 600. And I can't wait till we get um, the use of that. It's going to be an amazing thing for the west of Scotland. A new hall uh, where orchestras can come and large ensembles. Um, but, but the construction of the, of the school has shown us that there are different spaces within the building that we can actually use for music making, which may in fact suit this social distanced um, situation. And we're speaking to the likes of the Scottish Chamber Orchestra and so on about how they might uh, pr um, present their gala performance to open this new school, but use uh, um, open galleries in the place and um, um, this, uh, areas that, that haven't been associated with music in, in the minds of the builders of the school, but we are now thinking about, we, we can do a concert there, we could get a brass group up into that gallery and the sound can travel right through the whole school and uh, people can walk around and hear new music um, and we'll get youngsters at school and at college to make that music from scratch and we'll give opportunities uh, to um, new composers uh, um, from the area and from throughout Scotland um, and beyond, of course, uh, to make music for that community. I was going to say that basically, obviously, with the slow return to live performance that, you know, we all see as inevitable, do we think it'll lead composers to seek and make work in different ways? I mean, as you're saying, uh, uh, finding different places for music to thrive. I mean, we, we, we cherish our lovely concert halls with their, their, their wonderful acoustics and can't wait to get back to them. But is this a moment for us to doubly seize upon um, to, to show that music's place can be everywhere? Absolutely. I mean, we've got um, our cathedrals and churches are, are sort of built for social distancing. They're with their enormous, enormous roofs and balconies and, and um, but also the acoustic in these places is fantastic and that you will get sound carrying and mixing. You know, you could experiment with all sorts of kind of positions in that way. I think we will inevitably um, at the moment um, be possibly looking at writing for smaller ensembles. Um, I, I think it'll be a while. I think in the States they're looking at bringing string orchestras back before they bring in wind instruments <clears throat> and brass and um, maybe they can bring in percussion as well. But, um, but I think that's a very exciting area. And going back to your question about audiences as well, um, there is nothing like um, being with a live audience and um, communicating with them. Um, but with social media and performances online, you've got the opportunity to reach um, a far higher number of listeners than you would in a one-off concert in a concert hall. 
if I could just ask you each briefly, I mean, what, what might be your biggest concern for new music at this moment? I, can I can I start? Yeah. Um, I think well, I I, th I think it's it's everything is interconnected. So obviously the the issues that uh, are being had with aspects of social distancing, um, you know, it's it's all it all falls back on everybody within the industry. And I th think the fear in in the back of my head is know when will it go back to normal will it ever go back to normal um you know will will new music be put on the sort of back foot of everything else because you know um first of all you have to have orchestras ensembles concert halls back in place all of that sort of stuff needs to be in place even before you can start thinking about you know, commissioning or planning a festival planning a, a new commission. So it's, 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 that, it's that sort of process of you thinking, where are you in that sort of great grand scheme of things? And hopefully they, you know, the, the gatekeepers or the power, the people that hold the power to, to make things happen um, have not forgotten entirely about um, new music <laughs> in that sense. Um, and obviously uh, higher, higher up the chain, the, uh, government and all the rest of it so it's yeah it's my thing um further concerns anyone i'm really worried that um that people won't program new music so much simply because in order to recoup what they've lost financially um programmers will go for safe options and um program you know better known pieces um, so much good stuff has been done um, with programming new music and diverse music um, in recent years, and I would hate to see that lost. I, I get the impression that um, those organisations that have commissioned work that are now on hold um, are the kinds of organisations that have, in, have an integrity about them uh, in their commitment to the, the, the living composer. And the indications I'm getting from various people are, are saying that um, our, our, our priority is to get the, the new work done, no, to get the new commissioned work heard for the first time. Uh, they've put a lot of store and energy and indeed money into the commissioning of the work in the first place. It's important to uh, get it onto the stage and, and let the audience hear it. Beyond that, um, there are obviously going to be a lot of anxieties amongst composers about how that can be sustained uh, in, in um, financially difficult territory in, in the years ahead. My immediate worries have, have been in connection with choral music. Uh, I think some of us have mentioned that we're, we're, we work with uh, singers a lot, whether they're solo singers or choral singers. And it looks as if, you know, that the musicians who work with their mouths, whether they're singers or wind players, will, will be the last back to work. Um, now, uh, the, 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 the dangers that that faces for the world of, of choirs is immense. And I think it's been important, especially in the last week or so, for those of us involved in music to bring uh, these anxieties to the fore. Uh, what, what can be done uh, to help choirs? What can be done to sustain and maintain our wonderful uh, choral culture in this country? What can, what can make that world stay alive in this difficult time? And uh, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence out there that singing is dangerous. Um, well, we want to test that and uh, we want to find out what the researchers say. There are, the science is not settled, and, uh, but I think it needs to be settled in order for everyone to be safe, but also to indicate to uh, government and everyone, uh, everyone else that singing especially is really a part of a, a fundamental center of, of human activity and human culture. And if we lose it, uh, it's, it's, um, it would be a huge loss uh, to our civilization. And, and to make that advocacy, to, 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 to make the case for singing and, and music and culture generally, when there's so much focus on economic matters and, and of course health matters as well. But you know, 
singing brings about um, a, a lot for individuals. It, it's been shown to um, be of great help to the, the mental health of individuals and communities. And we should never lose that in the middle of this particular uh, health crisis. Absolutely, yes. Um, Hannah, anything else to add? Well, I just, I, I would hate for this to be a missed opportunity for everybody. I think audiences, the, the way in which people are interacting with each other through this pandemic, the way that technology is playing a part of, of everybody's uptake as a result of it. I think people are wanting to be involved in things more. You know, I think audiences, audiences have so much to contribute to, to new work, full stop both as it's being written, as it's being performed, and after it's been performed. And I think, um, I think that's something, I, I, th I think in a way we don't want to, I think we'd be missing something if we were looking at returning to the way things were as a, as a creative, um, you know, body of, of professionals. I think we have to keep evolving, you know, culture and music's within everybody's DNA and has an, an innate value um, to every aspect of society and to you know industries like cross sector so I feel that it new music can't just stand alone it has to be woven within the fabric of of society of of the way of of and, and cross sector for it to really survive I love this notion that it should fall to composers um, to keep reminding us to move forward as composers always have done we've lots more to talk about do stay with us as we discuss more of the challenges facing composers now and how all the remarkable music making we've seen at home and online in lockdown might affect what composers write in the future <laughs>